Good evening, everyone. We are continuing the story of the Judges. Uh, we finished the 21 chapters of the book of Judges and also the four chapters of Ruth. So before we move on, let me just uh, pull up some lessons from Naomi and Ruth's life of faith. Now, Naomi interprets what happens to her men. You remember her, her husband and her two sons, the whole family uprooted and went to Moab. And she interprets what happened to her men who all died, you now going to Moab as full, but returning without them as empty. And she considered it an affliction of misfortune by God. And this is the way that people, we tend to view earthly life. Uh, when things happen to us, we say God has done this sad thing to me and made my life bitter. Then we ask why, why does this bad thing happen? So people that we do not see the way God sees and we look at immediate crisis or difficulty or situation and respond to it with our old self-perception. We interpret what happens with our perceptions, that's our the way of thinking, and our emotions, our feelings, because we are hit hard by these kinds of happenings. And we don't relate our thoughts and our feelings to God's truth. Very often, we just let our thoughts and emotions run wild about God why God let it happen. And we really need to ponder on our way of thinking and attitude to what we are facing so that we may be more in tune with God's truths in our faith and line of action or talking, right? Because we think that God allowed something bad to happen to me. Of course, the reality is God looks at the wider span on eternity. Beyond our immediate situation, you know, beyond our thinking and our feelings. And God alone sees how one stitch, one pattern, one patch of our experiences, whether tragic or happy, it all comes together to form and then construct a continuous and unflowing tapestry picture that builds a complex system. It builds it up. Okay, God uses all our little, little experiences to build up into something that becomes a system and a network of interrelated connections. And that will unravel, form a big picture, a masterpiece of eternity. So to us, is a concept, but God is actually putting layers and multiple levels of our experiences together to form a picture, a big picture. So for Elimelech, he makes this life-changing decision to relocate the family to Moab. At, uh, in Ruth chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 1, he actually intended it to be for a while. They were going to Moab just for a while. But it turns out to be a never-to-return journey for him and his sons, which shows that our plans can turn out differently from what we have in mind. Yeah, they have a plan to stay in Moab for a while, but all the men never return. During the time that they're there, Marlon meets, marries, and brings Ruth into the family. And then brother Kilion does the same with Opa. Then we see the family live the witness of a godly people. That's the thing that we are not told, but we have to pick up for ourselves. Because Opa and Ruth, they are blessed with their husbands and mother-in-law's testimony of love and care. They are blessed by this family they marry into. So when the men are removed from the picture, they die. And sometimes we can ask this question, is dying necessarily a bad thing? So what happens after the men are gone is that Ruth chooses to respond with a commitment 
to the family that's left and the Lord. And so, you know, it, it's a, a good kind of situation and a good kind of relationship for us to think about application for ourselves, our own experiences. For example, Christian husbands, we can put in the wives as well, for in this case, Marlon and his brother Kelion, Christian husbands or godly husbands. What does the testimony of your active relationship with each other, with your wife, you know, show to others about your faith and your practice? So Marlon, Marlon and Kilion must have, together with their mother-in-law, uh, shown the equivalent of a Christian life, a Christian character. Because Ruth chooses to respond, you know, when, he, when Naomi wants to go back to Israel, go back to Bethlehem, choose, Ruth chooses to make a commitment to go with her. And Ruth shows that her responding faith and consistency in good times and also in an anticipated bad life is what she's prepared for. Yeah, because she is a widow going back with Naomi, she cannot expect a good life. Yeah, but she responds with faith and she's consistent. Then for Opa, though she has been blessed with their testimony and loves them, she does not go that further step to choose to be committed to the Lord. In a way, it's a picture like you have a Christian family, yeah, and then you have the two wives. One wife chooses to be a Christian and make her commitment. The other wife, Opa, enjoys their testimony as Christian, but she doesn't choose to be committed to God herself. Something like that. That's, that's a picture that we can, a similar picture we can gather. But Ruth proves the genuineness of her faith. She shows that her faith is genuine by her devotion to Naomi, her commitment to follow God, and her dedication to be discipled or mentored by Naomi in the laws of God. And that's in the words that she said, uh, in chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, she told Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. So she makes a commitment to follow God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. So she showed her dedication to follow Naomi okay, and to follow God. And then later on, we see the genuineness of her faith through her marriage to Boaz, according to the law of the kinsman redeemer. This is all in the story of the book of Ruth. And you can see that she does not choose to live selfishly for herself. She does not choose to live just for herself, but in fact to live a sacrificial life. And as a result, she becomes a blessing of love to Naomi. And in chapter 4 verse 15, she is better to Naomi than seven sons. Wow, Naomi only had two sons, but she's better to, to now, better than seven sons. So we find that Ruth finds her rightful place in God's will and fulfills her destiny, her destiny. That is even beyond her own realization. You know, she makes a commitment. She makes a commitment and a dedication, right? And she fulfills her destiny, her destiny beyond her own realization. Not just in her own generation, you can see the, the women of the community really praise her to Naomi and says she's better to Naomi than seven sons. So in her own generation, she finds her rightful place in God's will. She fulfills her destiny, her destiny 
And she also fits into the big picture of Messiah's genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, where she entered into the family tree of Jesus. And that is something that should be our testimony as well. Yeah, We need to find our rightful place in God's will and fulfill our destiny too. Okay, so let me put that down. Like rules, each of us needs to find our rightful place in God's will and fulfill our destiny. Now, coming back to Naomi's original full life with her husband and two sons. Now, that has become even more abundant with the dedication of Ruth, whom Naomi discipled, mentored in godliness. So she got, in that sense, her reward. Yeah, she got her reward for discipling, mentoring Ruth. And in discipling her daughter-in-law, which is equivalent to obeying the commission of Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we see that Ruth becomes the daughter-in-law who loves her and is better to her than seven sons. And this is made possible through Boaz, who plays the kinsman redeemer, who buys back uh, Ruth and the family property. And Boaz foreshadows the work of Jesus. He's a picture of Jesus buying back or redeeming the family of God's eternal kingdom. Jesus is the kinsman redeemer who redeems us from our bondage to sin, bondage to poverty, and so on. And God brings together the interrelated network of connections from Ruth and Boaz. It connect to David's life and work, as well as other people, into the bigger, big, bigger picture, the bigger masterpiece of the Messiah, Jesus, who will harvest the salvation of souls. And this is what I mean just now when I was talking about, I was talking about one stitch, one pattern, you know, one continuous formation of all our life experiences. Yeah, they join, join, join together with each other, connected to each other, and it becomes a masterpiece of eternity. Many layers, many, many levels. And that is what happens with Ruth. Yeah, that is what happens with Ruth as well as uh, Boaz. Then they connect into David because they become the great grandparents of David. And then on and on to the Messiah. So we see this short love story is a simple message, a very short story but it has many deep lessons and truths that in the darkness of the religious world and community we may live in. So in the darkness of the period of the judges. And for us also, you know, we can live in a religious community. We see that those who obey and honor God with their sacrificial, life, self-giving life will be blessed and they will be a blessing to their world and the larger family of God. So this is a picture, right? They are a light in the darkness of the period of judges. Yeah, and they are sacrificial and self-giving. And so they become a blessing. So as light and hope within a picture of decay, this story of Ruth is a story of light and hope in the midst of the spiritual decline, the moral decay and the darkness of Israel. We saw, the, we saw what happened in Israel in those 21 chapters. And in the midst of apostasy, you know, turning away from God, backsliding, syncretism means they mix the religion of other gods with their faith in, the, in Adonai. Yeah? and the corruption of God's people. So they are corrupting themselves and the purity and devotion to God of Ruth and Naomi is possible. 
So Ruth and Naomi, they can be pure and devoted in the midst of such a terrible situation. And this is also a picture of the condition of the Christian community. There's God's people who don't behave like his people should. And despite being in the minority of this kind of community, Ruth or we can actually obey and worship God correctly and even maintain it when others around us are compromising in their faith or their worship. There's actually somebody from a pagan land, but she's capable of worshipping and obeying God in the right way, especially if there's a consistent teacher and discipler, which in her case turns out to be her mother-in-law. And we see where people are losing their values and their hold on God and godliness. The saving grace of God we continues to reach out and attract others like Gentile Ruth to him. You see, Christians who lose their values, Christians who lose their hold on God and godliness, God doesn't need to totally depend on them for him to save people. New life in God or in Christ brings new purpose and excitement to the community. As we can see in the bus, you know, when Naomi returns with Ruth to the community, all the women are so excited. There's a lot of new purpose and excitement. And then Jews and Gent Christians alike are blessed with God's grace and are easily prone to take it for granted. But God is not done with them. You see, he continues to show grace while there is time before they harden to him and reach the point of no return. As long as we are not hardened to God and have not reached the point of no return, God continues to be able to reach us with his grace. The introduction of new members like Ruth and her son Obed into this community of God's people leads to renewed blessings. There's also joy and potential for growth. God continues his work through the long term of establishing the genealogy of the Messiah despite Israel's darkness. And so the last st statement I like to make is God can and does still do his saving work even though many of his people are not faithfully doing their part or their testimony. And that's the period of the judges. Yeah, God still saves people like Ruth because of minority like uh, Naomi. So, okay, I've done a very quick run through of uh, the book of Ruth. Uh, I have done the detailed Bible study lessons on this book before. And for those of you who might want to revisit or have not gone through it, you can uh, uh, refer to it from this playlist YouTube link. Okay, so now what we are going to continue with is the period of the judges ending with two, two more people. The period of the judges ends with Eli the priest and then another key figure in the person of Samuel. Samuel is a prophet, a priest, and the last judge who brings Israel into the next phase of their existence as a nation under God. Under Samuel, the nation of Israel will become a kingdom. Okay, so we go into the book of 1 Samuel straight away now. And the first chapter, we see Samuel's birth. What's important for his birth is that he is born as a result of a childless woman's prayer. Hannah, she prayed desperately for a son and God gave her what she asked for. In short, Samuel's existence comes about as a combination of a woman's desire and God's will and purpose. So this is uh, what life is frequently about a combination of our choice and God's will or God's purpose that things, the way things work out. 
we have a human's request that is the mother Hannah and God's willing response because God has a will and a purpose for Samuel. And Hannah, in gratitude for having the son, she gives the son back to the Lord to serve him. That's what we're going to see in the first chapter. Now let's look at the story. Samuel's father, Elkanah, had two wives. The mo his, her, his mother is Hannah. At the moment, she is uh, childless, right? At the beginning of the story. And then he has a stepmother, Penina. Penina had children. Year after year, when they went to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to God, Hannah's rival provoked her to irritate her. Because she had no children, she was childless. And so Hannah prayed to the Lord for a son, promising to give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. We see before Samuel is born, his mother Hannah is the childless wife to a man with two wives. Her situation shows one significant reason why marriage should be the union of one man with just one wife, instead of more. And we see in verse 6 that Penina is described as Hannah's rival. Now what comes to mind when we think of the word rival? What comes to mind when we think of the word rival? Anybody would like to Competitor. Thank you. Competitor, right. So, the Elkanah actually marries two wives who are competing with each other. Hannah's rival, she is competing with Hannah. See, the men's attention and resources are divided between two wives. Yeah? And wives and the children become competitors especially if there is jealousy and rivalry through coming from two or even more different wives and loyalties. And if there's no harmony between the wives, they divide the family instead of being one. Then the husband's attention also becomes divided because he has to take care of two families because there are two wives. So, the story continues where Hannah prays for a son and God answered her prayer and gave her a son whom she named Samuel. After he was weaned, she brought him to Eli the priest at the house of the Lord at Shiloh and she gave Samuel to the Lord. And then Samuel worshipped the Lord there and ministered under Eli the priest. So he became an apprentice a trainee. And what's significant here is that it's out of a sorrow and disgrace because she was a childless wife and in their time that was a disgrace. So Hannah longs and prays for a son. And Samuel's birth comes about as God's answer to her misery and her prayer. She honors her promise to God and then she gives him back to serve the Lord. And then under Eli's wings, Samuel receives spiritual supervision and he begins to worship God. It is important and necessary for individuals like Samuel to be properly guided spiritually to worship and serve God from their youth. So parents... This is also for us, the same lesson, yeah? Important and necessary for children in your family to be properly guided spiritually, to worship and serve God while your children are young. From the time they are able to learn and understand what they are doing. And don't think that they are too young to do it, okay? They're never too young to do it. This happens even though, you know, Eli is able to supervise and teach Samuel to worship God. This happens even though Eli's own personal and family life are in a shambles. Wow, this is, you know, may come as a surprise that 
Eli's own personal and family life are in a terrible state spiritually, but he is still able to guide Samuel to worship and serve God. He supervises Samuel successfully, right? But don't forget that Samuel also has a part. He also has a choice. And the credit is Samuel's own responsive heart. Okay, so that's something important to recognize. He can be terrible at it in his own personal life, but he is able to bring Samuel up successfully in the early years because Samuel is the one who chooses to have a responsive heart. Now, Eli's own heart is not responsive to God. He just knows what should be done. So he knows the theory. He knows what should be uh, the spiritual life, what should the spiritual life be like. But his heart is not responsive to God and he and his family will suffer for it. Now, a caution to be aware that we may serve God in working with others, but we still need to be mindful and responsible for our own personal and family spiritual condition. And, and that is uh, sadly, sad to say, that is the truth with many pastors' families. Yeah, many pastors' families. They are very dedicated. They serve God in working with their, with their flock, with their church members. But then, you know, their own personal and spiritual, uh, family spiritual condition is quite uh, sad because the family the children are not, not truly God worshippers themselves, right? But the pastor uh, serves God to help other people to worship God. So it's a very sad state, but it is a true thing. We see it in Eli, right? And we can see it also in our generation among pastors. So that is chapter one, the uh the background to Samuel's birth and his family situation and also a little bit of Eli's family. Then we move on to chapters 2 and 3 and this is where we see a contrast of godliness. A contrast of godliness. Here in these two chapters, we see the story of how Eli's sons, they serve as priests and they contrast with the calling and ministry of Samuel. Now, Eli's sons show how they may appear to be serving God, but they are actually serving their own carnal appetites. They, as priests, they show contempt for God. Samuel, on the other hand, is responsible with the word and the work of God that is entrusted to him even from a young age. So he has a teachable heart, but not Eli's sons. And basic teacher is the same, Eli. One is the father and one is the mentor. We see that Eli's sons were wicked priests. So the Bible itself calls them wicked with no regard for the Lord. And they forcefully took the meat of worshippers for themselves before the fat was burned up in offering to God. Now, what we can see from here is that Eli's sons have grown familiar with the things of God. Now, we get too uh, used to things that we do in our, in our church, in our Christian setting. We get so familiar that we take for granted, yeah, and we show contempt, yeah. So they take God for granted and they serve in their ministry as priests with a sense of entitlement, yeah, belongs to them. So you see, they forcefully took the meat of worshippers for themselves. They have a sense of entitlement. This is my right, my share. And Nothing dramatic or drastic happens to them. You know, there's no lightning to strike them dead. And God does not appear to do anything to them. 
And so they become bold. They become very daring. They don't fear God. They also become daring with worshippers and they take what is allocated to them as well as what should rightfully be offered to God. Remember that Leviticus 3.16 tells us that all the fat is the Lord's. But they just, if they pick up the fat for themselves, they will just keep it and forget about God. No respect for God. They show contempt. And this situation is not unnoticed. Eli knew. Eli knew what they were doing. He also knew they were sleeping with the women serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So they turned the women into prostitutes. Very sad case. See, spiritually, this is the period of the judges. And with priests like that, you know, what hope is there for the teaching of God? Yeah. So though Eli rebuked the sons, they did not listen to his rebuke because they had reached a point where they have no more uh, chance. You, if you remember the time of Noah, uh, sorry, not Noah, Moses and Pharaoh, the point when Pharaoh's heart was so hard that he just could not repent. And in this case, the same thing happened for the two sons of Eli, the priests, and it was the Lord's will to put them to death. So we can be so hardened to God with our sin, we don't listen, and it reaches the point where God says, enough is enough. These people will die for their sin. And so this is one of the incidents where the Bible makes it clear that someone who serves God in the office of priest or a minister, so can be a pastor in our in our in our modern context. Yeah, it's so wicked and hardened. Okay, can be a leader, can be a pastor, become so wicked and hardened, they will not allow themselves to respond to rebuke and correction. And this episode is a warning that when people supposedly serving God disregard correction for their sin and they harden their hearts consistently. They are putting themselves in danger of God's judgment. Now, the consequences may not be immediate. Like I said, may not be lightning and thunder strike them. Yeah, But with God, consequences will definitely come. It is just a matter of time. Yeah, it's just a matter of time. But with God, there is no escape if this is how we treat God with contempt. Now, Eli himself does not escape scot-free. Eli received a prophecy of rebuke and judgment from a man of God for scorning God's sacrifice. So, so the, the rebuke of his sons actually also falls on him because he scorns God's sacrifice and offering by honouring his sons more than God. Because his sons, they fatten themselves on the choice parts of every offering made by God's people, Israel, and Eli himself also helped himself. The man, the, prof uh, the prophet, prophesied that there will be no old man in Eli's family line. That means from this generation on, okay, all the descendants, nobody will live to an old age. Nobody will live to an old age. Hophni and Phinehas will die will, while God will raise a faithful priest to minister before God's anointed one always. So that is a prophecy of doom for Eli's uh, family. And we learn that Eli does his work as priest, but failed in his duty as father to his sons. You see, he rebuked his sons, but his actions are inconsistent with what he told them. Yeah, his rebuke and his actions somehow don't match. He tells his sons what they have been doing is wrong, 
but then he joins them in eating the share that they snatch from God. You know, if it is wrong, then he should not eat that, eat the, the share that they snatch from God. But he participates in their contempt for God by eating what belongs to God as well. So he is not careful to guard and separate himself. And that is something that we must be watch, watchful for, for ourselves. Huh? Okay, What we say and what we do. He participates in his son's contempt for God by eating what belongs to God. Right? So it is ironic that while, that while he tells his son it is wrong to eat the fat that belongs to God, he himself eats the fat that they snatch from God. For us, if we criticize someone else for what they say or do is wrong, and then we do it ourselves, we are going to fall into the same judgment. Yeah, we are going to fall into the same judgment. As uh, Jesus says in Matthew 7, uh, do not judge or you will be judged. You judge people with your yardstick, then you will be judged equally with the same yardstick. And so for Eli, he is not judging. Here he's disciplining his son, but he does a very bad job of it. So we see that God speaks up for himself to show his disapproval of Eli and his sons. God sends the men to Eli and he wants Eli to know the seriousness of their sin. And so for us, when we read, we must learn to recognize that God speaks to us and God uses a person to speak to us like the prophet, but God can also more consistently use his recorded word, the Bible, to speak to us. Yeah, so we're reading the story here, and the story is God's word speaking to us. If God speaks to us through people's experiences or actions, like what's happening with Eli, okay, and his sons, or through direct teaching. At times, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit's conviction. Whether God speaks to us through what happens to people in the Bible or through the Holy Spirit, it is important that we be responsive rather than desensitize ourselves to Him by hardening our heart. And again, I can tie it to our Sunday morning lesson, um, the accountability lesson yesterday, right? Where Jesus, when He comes, he comes at a time when the world will be just like the people of Noah. Yeah. So the, the lessons of Noah's period, you know, the lesson of people's sin in the world, uh, obviously has not sunk in to the people before Jesus comes. Because the people in the world are going to be just like the people of the flood. And that is many, many generations later. So people are actually not responsive. They are desensitizing themselves by hardening their heart to God's word. So here God speaks to us through Eli's experience as well. And God will honor, this is what he says, he will honor those who honor him. But those who despise God will be disdained. And as priests, Levi and his sons, and that is for us the equivalent of Christians, okay, should know what they are doing is wrong. They are supposed to teach people the right way to worship God. Yes, and even for us as Christians, we're supposed to represent God, to show people the right way to worship God, to show fellow Christians who are younger, and also to show non-Christians the right way to worship God. Since Eli and his sons despise God consistently by their actions, he will disdain them. And from Hophni and Phineas Hass on, the family line of Eli will not enjoy long life. So this is the consequence that will roll down into the future generations. Yeah, you can see future generations have a short life, not a long life, because of these three ancestors, Hophni and Phinehas, as well as Eli. 
So that is the contrast, uh, the details of Eli's sons, a contrast of godliness that we will see now with Samuel. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was read. There were not many visions. We see that as a father, Eli is a poor teacher by his example. But nevertheless, he's able to guide Samuel. And that's because Samuel is responsive. In the days of the judges, people are not faithful. People are not sensitive to God. And that's the reason his word to them is rare. And they don't have many visions. See, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And they do not have many visions. So that's what's happening during this period of judges. People not faithful, people not sensitive. And more of them are doing as they see fit. You remember the book of Judges? Everyone did as he saw fit. That was mentioned in Judges a few times. Yeah, so people were doing as they saw fit. And there are more of them doing that than those who are faithful to God and his word. The story continues with Samuel lying down one night in the temple and God came and God called him. But Samuel didn't understand and he thought that Eli had called him. So he ran to Eli and he told Eli, here I am, you called me. Eli sent him back to lie down because he also didn't realize. This happened again until three times when Eli realized that, oh, the Lord was calling Samuel. And that was the time he taught Samuel to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So he teaches Samuel how to respond to God. And in this episode, we see that Samuel shows sensitivity to God's calling. When God calls he responds. At first, he doesn't know it is God. But then, when in time, he learns from Eli how to respond to God. Now, Eli himself is not successful with teaching his own sons to hear God talking to them. So they cannot hear God rebuking them. Yeah. So cannot hear God talking to them or rebuking them. You know, sometimes we read the Bible, we cannot, we cannot pick up that God is rebuking us in the Bible. Yeah, we, we cannot, we're not sensitive, we're not responsive, so we cannot pick up that God is rebuking us because we don't make ourselves responsive and willing enough to listen. So instead of learning to hear God, they learn to take advantage of their position as priests to snatch God's offerings. That, that's referring to the fat that they want from the worshippers. They hunger to feed their carnal appetite rather than the spiritual appetite for God and his concerns. You know, we are supposed to, First Peter 2, 2, right? Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, but they don't. They crave carnal food. And there is more of their old self active in them than the life of God's spirit. And so it is important for us to hear God speaking to us through various means. Okay, God, just now we explored, God can speak to us through different ways, through people, through the Bible, through the Holy Spirit. And within the Bible, uh, God can speak to us through people's experiences. God can speak to us through commands. Yeah, so there are various ways God can speak to us. And the necessary response is what Samuel did. Invite God to speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Yeah, so it's important. We want to hear from God. We want to know what the Bible says. Then it's important to invite God to speak and for God to soften our hearts. And then we have a posture of listening a spiritual posture of listening. 
So the Lord told Samuel something he would do that will make the ears of everyone who heard of it tingle. So the popping of the ears, huh? that he told Samuel he would judge Eli's family forever because of the sin he knew that his sons made themselves content contemptible and he failed to restrain them. So we see the Lord does not make known his, sorry, the Lord does make known his plans to men. Yeah, in this case, Samuel. Samuel is privileged to know what God intends to do about the family line of Eli. On his part, Eli has not brought up his sons in the way they should go. We see Proverbs 22 verse 6, it says, Bring up children when they are young in the Lord, and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. But Eli's sons have reached the point of no return because Eli has failed to guide them and discipline them when they were still teachable. Yeah, so there comes a point when people stop being teachable if we don't teach them. Yeah, so we have to make sure that if it is our responsibility to teach, then we must speak up. We cannot remain silent. Otherwise, there comes a point in time, like we saw in the book of Judges many times, uh, people stop listening. For example, the Benjamites, right? The Benjamites who were uh, uh, raping the, the Levites' concubine. They stopped being teachable. So have we reached our unteachable point? The time when we hear but we no longer have any application, life, response, or change. Yeah. So, Samuel needs to be able to handle, that's the next thing, huh? Samuel needs to be able to handle the knowledge about his trainer, his mentor. Can you imagine you, this person is your spiritual teacher or your spiritual parent, and then you hear all the terrible things about your spiritual parent or your mentor. Are you going to lose your faith? Are you going to backslide? We tend to hold people in high profile with great regard. Yeah, so those big names in the, in the Christian community, we hold them with high regard because we have high expectations of them. They are so anointed and they are so uh, big name, yeah, big guns. And oftentimes when such people prove to be idols of play feet and they fall short of expectations. So they disappoint people because they are shown to suddenly uh, be doing the wrong things. Then people who look up to and respect them backslide and even lose faith. So for Samuel, he needs to be able to handle the knowledge about Eli. You know, Eli has been training and teaching him. Does he now look down on Eli and say, Eli, I despise you because you are like that. Okay, I lose my faith. Now, Samuel continues to relate to Eli as his teacher without losing, losing respect for him or losing faith for himself. Okay, so this is the healthy response from Samuel. He continues to respond correctly, he shows that his saving faith is rightly anchored in God, so that when his teacher, mentor Eli proves to be a failure in his own life, Samuel continues to remain steadfast. So, continue the story, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and all Israel recognized Samuel as a prophet. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So earlier on, when we saw that the word of the Lord was rare and there were not many visions, now the picture turns around that the Lord continued to appear and reveal his word. Okay, so the opposite is happening because there is a Samuel. And we see through all these chapters here, the first part of 1 Samuel, we see that God uses mightily the son that Hannah asked for. Remember just now we, 
we talked about the birth of Samuel was an interaction. Yeah, the birth of Samuel was an interaction. Okay, comes about as a combination between a woman's desire or request and God's will and purpose. And God has a, a way to use Samuel to serve him. So now, okay, that was our introduction. And at this time, we see that, at this time, we see that God uses the son that Hannah asked for in a mighty way. Growing up, Samuel distinguishes himself by his consistent relationship with God. Okay, he is, he is uh, consistent in his relationship with God and that is where God is able to use him as God's mouthpiece. And so Samuel becomes a prophet. Yeah, he speaks God's word to the people as a prophet. And he becomes a prophet that the people recognize as speaking God's word. And God continues to reveal himself and then speak to Samuel at Shiloh because Samuel is committed to listen to God. So God, Samuel is committed to listen and represent God to the people. Now, what happens with Eli's sons is a clear message that people who worship and or people who serve God and God's people may not necessarily be right with God. Okay, so this is a, can be a hard truth, can be a hard truth to take. People who worship or people who serve God or do both may not necessarily be right with God. So that speaks to us ourselves as well. You know, we may not necessarily be right with God. Remember, think of Cain. Cain worshipped God, but he was not right with God. Yeah? So we see that they or we may be ministering to God's people and still be showing contempt for God in their actions and their attitude. This will be worse for them if they harden their hearts and then they refuse to respond to rebuke and correction. So in other words, for us, yeah, for us, if we really want to, if we really don't want to belong to this category, what is one thing that we must always be mindful? One thing we must always our, be mindful, yes? Our hearts? Yes, how to, en how to ensure that our hearts are not hard. Here is the answer. We must be prepared to respond to rebuke and correction. Okay, we must be prepared to respond to rebuke and correction. Because if we are not responsive to rebuke and correction, that's when our hearts, you know, when we do wrong things, we will continue doing wrong things and we will harden our hearts and we don't change. Yes, but if we are prepared to respond to rebuke and correction, and you see nowadays people don't dare to rebuke and correct because they say people, uh, people criticize them for judging. Yeah, so we all keep quiet and mind our own business. Now, that is not a healthy thing because it means all of us will, either in ignorance or in willfulness, we will be doing wrong thing, not being rebuked and corrected, and our hearts will harden. That is the sad, sorry and sad state of the book of Judges. Yeah, people don't rebuke and correct because they do their own thing and then it comes to a point when they keep doing the wrong thing and they take it as the right to do that and then when people start to rebuke or correct they will get upset so sensitivity to rebuke and correction in a healthy way sensitivity in a healthy way is important okay so for People like Eli's sons, their hearts are proven to be not right. They may outwardly be worshippers or those who do God's work, 
but their actions and attitudes prove that they choose their human way, no longer choose God's holy way. And this is seen especially in their relationships within their own families and the way they relate to or treat God's people. You know, so we, we should must not harden to people, right? Uh, starting with our own families, we must not harden to our own people. Spouses must not harden to each other, right? And then your children, and then within the body of Christ. How we actually respond to each other and how we treat to each other. So these are all important indicators, yeah? Important indicators, important indicators of whether our hearts are still responsive and sensitive to right and wrong. Okay, the word indicators, they, they help us to see. They help us to realize if we are prepared to uh, reflect and evaluate ourselves. And then in contrast to Eli's sons, Samuel shows a responsive heart to God. He maintains a sensitivity to God all the days of his life throughout his ministry until the day he retires and he asks people, hold me accountable. Have I cheated anybody? Have I taken any bribes? Yeah, so they say no. So he maintains a sensitivity to God and the right and wrong things until he retires and he dies. Unlike Hophni and Phinehas, right? Samuel will live and serve God and people honestly with integrity to the end of his ministry. And that's what I just said just now when he asked them to hold him accountable before he retired. Okay, so being held accountable, being responsive to rebuke and correction is very important. Okay, so I've got the YouTube link for the detailed lessons of 1 Samuel. I've gone through quite fast uh, these lessons because I'm going through the story. But for the detailed uh, lessons, you can look at this uh, YouTube link playlist. Okay, before I continue, if there's time, anybody wants to ask any uh, or share any insights It take a bit of time to think through and uh, gather your thoughts. If you have an insight or a question, uh, you can share with us. Did Samuel's sons, were they faithful to the Lord or were they also a little bit deviating? Okay, you are very good. You picked up. Later on, Samuel's sons were also shown to be corrupt. So it shows that Samuel, like I used the example just now, pastors who are very big names, very successful, yeah. Sometimes they have no time for their own their own family. So chances are very highly likely that Samuel himself failed to discipline and to train his own sons. You see, so somebody very successful can actually be a failure at home. Yeah. Definitely a lesson for us that we need to learn to balance success in ministry with people outside with our uh, training and our upbringing at home with our own family. Yeah, thank you for that point. So it really shows the contrast Anybody else has insight question or something to share? So it's not easy. Huh? At the end of the day, we all have limited time, right? We all have limited time and we need to balance our time and definitely we need to seek God for, uh, you know, sometimes people are too extreme on one side too devoted to family training that they neglect the, the family of God part. And there are people who are the other way around. 
too committed to the family of God part and neglect their own family at home. And we need to balance both. And one of the best ways I think to balance both is if let's say we are really a community, close community where we, we are so close that we can rebuild each other's children. Yeah, okay. A little bit like, you know, in the book, uh, when in the book of Luke, when Jesus went to the Jesus went to the temple at, at age 12, right? The community they went, the, the families went together as a community. They look after each other's children. Yeah, so that's something that we should actually should be doing, being able to look after each other's children and not feel that we are being criticized or judged when people discipline our own children. You know, and we don't look at it as a, a, a criticism of us as parents. If we have the right mentality, then it actually works for us at a, as a community. Okay, if no, then I will probably have just enough time to do the next part. Anybody has anything to ask? Them? If not, uh, I will probably have just enough time to do the next part. Okay, if not, I will just continue with the next three chapters. First Samuel 4 to 6, the loss and the return of the ark of God. At one point, the story makes during the era of the judges is that when God's people fail to honor his glory, God can take care of himself. Right? But for the people, when they fail, they suffer consequences. For their disregard for God. So it's, it's important for us not to think, oh, God can take care of himself, so let me not bother, right? We will suffer consequences. So Israel, the story has Israel fighting the Philistines and was defeated. Then the elders of Israel made the decision to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh to go with them and save them from their enemies. You see, they have the wrong understanding that the ark, the ark of the Lord will save them from their enemies. This is a serious theological mistake. Serious wrong understanding of God. The Israelites are defeated at the hands of the Philistines and the Israelites realize it is because God is not fighting with them to give them the victory. And they think that it is because they didn't bring the ark to war with them. So they sent for the ark of God to come to the war, war zone. And the situation shows their wrong understanding between the things of God and God himself. Yeah, The ark is something of God, but the ark is not God. Yeah, So they don't understand the things of God and the separation from God himself. God is separate from the things of God. So Hophni and Phinehas, as the priests, they very bravely, they went with the Ark of the Covenant of God. But the Philistines defeated the Israelites and the Israelites lost 30,000 foot soldiers. And then the Ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons died. So the news went back to Eli and he fell backward off his chair, he broke his neck and he died because he was very old, 98 years and heavy, eating too much of the, the food of God, yeah, the fat. And he had led Israel 40 years. So he was a judge before Samuel. He was the judge for 40 years. Then Phinehas's pregnant wife went into labor and gave birth to a boy she named Ichabod meaning the glory has departed from Israel because the ark had been captured and then that's and then she died. Okay, so this story, we see that both the people and the two priests who should be teaching and reminding them have the wrong understanding of God. Okay, you so this is the wrong belief or the wrong theology we may have. They think it is the ark that gives them victory 
they think with the up present, God will help them defeat the Philistines. And by implication, this makes God subject to the up. So the up is the way that they will wave like a magic wand. Eh? Then God has to obey them. Okay, so they treat the up like the magic wand that as long as they handle the up, God has to obey. And they don't understand that the up is only a symbol to represent that God is present with Israel. The ark by itself is only an object. It has no power. But it is God who has the power. He is not obliged to fight for Israel just because the ark is there. In fact, the existence of the ark should, the other way around, remind them that they should uphold their calling to be a holy people who represent God. For us, God's presence in the church and God's presence in us. Remember, God is present in us through the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit anointing yeah, as God's people. So God is present in us. God is present in the church as his tabernacle. We are his tabernacle. And God's presence should remind us to uphold our calling as his holy people with his commission. Now, since Israel fails to obey God or even to understand Him, not surprisingly, they and the two priests become vulnerable to defeat because they are fighting with the wrong theology. They suffer great losses, including the death of the two priests and those who do not go into the battlefield. Even those who don't go into the battlefield like Eli and Phinehas' wife, they die. Israel also continues to be under the oppressive power of the Philistines through to the reigns of Saul and David. Okay, so the power of the Philistines is not broken. Move on to 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. We see that the Philistines carried God's ark into Dagon's temple and they put it beside Dagon. And the next morning, the people of Ashdod, they find Dagon fallen on his face, flat with the head and hands broken off on the ground before the ark. So Dagon is no fight for God. The Lord afflicted the people of Ashdod with tumors and devastation. Then seeing the hand of the God of Israel was heavy on them and on their God Dagon, they sent the ark to Gath, the Gath. God afflicted that city with an outbreak of tumors, and then they sent the ark to Ekron, and those who did not die were afflicted with tumors. So you can see that God's reputation suffers. Because the Philistines defeat Israel and they carry off God's ark. Now, in ancient times, you know, the, the victorious army. The people will think that it is their God that has given them victory over the defeated army. So they have victory over the defeated God. Yeah, The defeated army means the army's God also has been defeated. That's why their God gives them victory and defeat the other side. So they thought that their God, Dagon, helped them to capture Israel's God in the form of the ark. You see, once again, these are people who are not God's people and they have the wrong understanding of God. They think that they capture the ark means they capture the God of Israel. And the God of Israel is powerless, to, uh, is inferior to their Dagon. But then they learn a big lesson about which is the more powerful God when they find their God Dagon broken on the ground in front of the ark of God. See, this God of Israel, he doesn't just break Dagon, he inflicts death. So he's showing the Philistines, I break your God and I kill your people to show that your God is not as powerful as you think. So God inflicts death, devastation and tumors on all the five Philistine cities that they bring the ark to. And their captive God you know, they thought that they captured this God. This captive God shows that he, what he can do to their God and to them right in their own territory. Okay, the, the lion came into their territory. Yeah. 
wherever they bring him in the land, he inflicts disease and devastation. Not surprisingly, he's the God of creation and he's the God above all gods. He created everything. And after seven months of this torture, the Philistines consulted their priests and diviners. They sent the Ark of God with a guilt offering of five gold tumors, five gold rabbits, uh, sorry, rats, to honor Israel's God. They put the cut on the, uh, so they put the Ark, sorry, the Ark on a new cut pulled by two cows that have never, that have calved and never been yoked. That, that means these two cars have never worked before, pulled, never put a yoke. And then the cars went straight up to Bet Shemesh without turning right or left. And they are followed, the cut, they are followed and watched by the rulers of the Philistines. And the people of Bet Shemesh were harvesting wheat when they saw the returning ark. And then they rejoiced and chopped up the wood of the cut to sacrifice the cows to the Lord. So, with seven months, the Philistines could see that they were helpless against the God of Israel. And they had to find out how to appease this God and get rid of him from their homeland. And they followed the instructions of their priests and diviners to honor Israel's God so that he will lift his hand from them, from their gods and their land. Their religious leaders advised them, don't harden your hearts. Again, you see? Sensitivity, don't harden your hearts. Even the, even the other non-believers of God realize don't harden their hearts like the Egyptians and Pharaoh did. They show that they have knowledge of God's salvation. So you see people have a right knowledge and a, also a wrong knowledge of God. Yeah, that's the thing. People have a rojak of right and wrong knowledge of God. So they show that they have knowledge of God's salvation in saving the Israelites from the bondage of Egypt. And the mighty works of God are known far and wide. People have knowledge of God. People are not ignorant of God's salvation power and work. So the problem is not a lack of the knowledge of God and what God does. The true problem is a lack of response. Okay, true problem is a lack of response and especially repentance to turn to God, his truth and his ways. So this is the reality of people, including people who serve in ministry, but who are kind of like uh, not, not in God's good, good books. Yeah, the problem is their lack of response and lack of repentance to God and what he says to us. And so for the Philistines, God convinces them that he is the one behind everything that happened to them after his ark was brought to their Philistine cities. He shows that the cows pulling the cart, he makes the cart, the cart go straight to the Levite town of Bet Shemesh back in Israel territory. And so he shows the Philistines that he is the God that they were suspecting but not sure. Now the leaders know for sure. So God struck down 70 men of Bet Shemesh for opening up the ark to look inside. And they told the people of Kiriath Jearim to take the ark away because, wow, this ark is terrible. Their own people also died. And then they took the ark to Abinadab's house where son Eliezer was consecrated to guard it. And God shows that he is no respecter of person. He shows the Philistines he is powerful God. And then he also shows his own people who should know his command, that they are not to treat his ark like any other ordinary object and just open up the ark and look inside. You know, so 70 of them die for looking into the ark. Okay, so we finished the story up to this point and we finished just on time. Any burning comment or question? If not, it's time to end for the night.
anybody has any um, anything to share before we close for the night? Okay, so we see that God knows how to take care of himself. It is God's people that must know how to respect and respond to God. Okay, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are a good God. You show yourself to be holy and you want your people to be holy too. And you have given us examples of what is right and what is wrong, uh, even among your people, in the persons of uh, Eli and his two sons, and also in the person of Samuel. We learn, Lord, that you speak for yourself and you don't just look at people's service and ministry. You also look at their attitudes and their sensitivity and their response when you rebuke them and when you correct them. Help us, O oh Lord, so that these are lessons that will teach and challenge us to be faithful to your word, to know your word well, as we can see that whether the Philistines or the Israelites, they do, both the Israelites themselves also have wrong understanding of you in some ways especially your ark and the difference between your ark and you. So we pray, God, that we will be faithful to know your word and to stand firm on it, that it will guide and it will direct us. And very importantly, it will bring us life as we learn to respond to your word and to be sensitive to you, especially where we need to be rebuked and corrected. And we pray, Father Lord, that more of us will minister to each other in this way so that we will all be a strong people of God who show that we care about each other and that we learn to trust each other the way we should as your family, your children. We pray and give you thanks for all these in the powerful, mighty name of Jesus. Amen.